Howdy, y'all. Welcome back. Picture this for me. The year is 1935. The United States of America is on the brink of financial devastation. Just two decades earlier, the country was catapulted to the forefront of world affairs, helping tip the scales in favor of what the history books calls world democracy. As the German enterprise of the early 20th century is stemmed, the United States, boastful and proud, entered the Roaring Twenties with vigor and gusto. America had become nothing less than a world power. However, the shiny new coat of paint over the centuries of infighting, political and social turmoil, and lack of need for industrial parts after the war, mixed with a growing gap between the class systems, did little to quell what the 1930s would bring. With the onset of the Great Depression, the longest, deepest, and most widespread depression of the 20th century, stock prices in America plummeted. This had reverberating effects around the world. For reference, the Great Recession of 2008 saw the gross domestic product fall an average of 1%. During the Great Depression, from Black Thursday, October 24, 1929, through 1932, the gross domestic product fell over 15%. Countries all around the world felt the effects of this, with the largest impact being on architectural advancements as nearly all major construction projects worldwide were halted, and also on farming, where crop prices fell by upwards of 60% in some of these countries. In America, the unemployment rate skyrocketed to nearly 25%, or nearly one in every four adult Americans being unemployed. Now, why did I paint this picture for you? Let's bring it full circle and dive into the topic of today's video. The year is 1935. At the pinnacle of the Great Depression, New York City has again fallen into a state of disarray. This is when a group of elites, masons, government officials, lawmakers, fraternal order of policemen, a who's who of the most powerful men in New York, gathered together atop the Empire State Building where they planned to change the fate of New York City and in return of America. In the year 1935, the New York World's Fair Corporation was formed, which included such names as Grover Whalen, the former chief of police, as well as Winthrop Aldrich, Mortimer Buckner, Ashley Cole, New York Mayor LaGuardia, as well as most other prominent business leaders of the time who called New York City home. The intention of this corporation was to plan the most extravagant, the most spectacular, the most astounding World's Fair the world had ever seen. A mesmerizing event which would not only unite the countries of the world in a desperate attempt to spark world economy, but alas, the fair in New York City would be the first of its kind, a world's fair which focused entirely on the future to come. In doing so, the business tycoons of New York hoped to ignite the interest of those less impacted by the depression, stimulating the economy, as well as providing the youth and those devastated by the depression with a brighter outlook for the future to come. Atop the Empire State Building, New York shakers and movers made a plan that would reshape America and the rest of the world. Today, we will look through the oldest, rarest, most unique, and seldom seen and discussed photographs of the 1939 World's Fair in New York City. Recently, I had the luck of finding the official guidebook to the New York's World Fair of 1939 at a local swap meet. To supplement these photographs, we will also take a look through this official guidebook, which costs just 25 cents at the time of production, although I did pay a good bit more than that for it today. It's not in the best shape, but the information here and the photographs added in the guidebook are so telling of just how monumental an event this World's Fair was that I felt it imperative to share with you. Essentially, the 1939 World's Fair was known as the World of Tomorrow, the first World's Fair to focus on the future rather than the present or the past. To say this event was the most advertised World's Fair would be an understatement. During the 1938 Major League Baseball season, for example, all three New York teams wore patches on their sleeves featuring the Trilon, the Parisphere, and the year 1939. Another example is Howard Hughes, who flew around the world in 1938 in a specially designed aircraft to promote the fair in New York. Overall, the World's Fair was targeted 
to drive business back into America. However, the historic value of the World's Fair was not lost. The opening of the fair in New York coincided with the 150th anniversary of George Washington being inaugurated as the first president of the United States, which had occurred in what is now Lower Manhattan. However, before the fair could open, a meticulous planning cycle saw the fair being built on reclaimed land at the edge of New York City, a former ash heap and landfill along the Flushing River, once known as Corona Meadows. As history goes, Corona Meadows was, for hundreds of years, the home to a large town of Algonquin indigenous people. By the year 1666, most of these indigenous people had been displaced by European settlers, and by the late 17th century, Corona Meadows was covered with the large farmhouses and plantations that we see of the colonial era. By the end of the 1800s, paved roads had been built along the meadows, followed by railroad lines during the Industrial Revolution. By the late 1800s, the meadows were considered to be dilapidated, with the resources having been spent. The area became overgrown and abandoned. In the early 1900s, Michael de Jong purchased what was now the marshy land of the meadows. He envisioned, along with the government of New York, to converting the quote worthless marshland into a large industrial port and ash dump. However, with the onset of World War I, the industrial port idea was dropped and the meadows served solely as an ash and trash dump. As incinerators had become the commonplace of New York City, once the trash was turned into ash, it needed a place to be dumped. This is where we have the meadows. During nearly 30 years of filling, around 50 million cubic yards of ash and waste were dumped onto the meadow site. One particular ash mound rose nearly 100 feet high and was known as Mount Corona. By 1931, the ash heap was nearly entirely full, with most ash mounds over 50 feet high. This is when, in 1935, Robert Moses, New York City Parks Commissioner, linked with and joined the New York World's Fair Corporation, presenting his idea to transform the Corona ash heaps into the greatest World's Fair America had ever seen. Moses's plan was quickly approved and seemingly overnight, thousands of feet of ash and debris were transformed into a stable piece of land capable of hosting one of the largest events in human history. The World of Tomorrow, New York City's World's Fair, opened on April 30th, 1939, the 150th anniversary of Washington's first inauguration. The opening saw 206,000 people in attendance. Albert Einstein gave the opening speech as the fair's lights were ceremoniously lit. President Roosevelt also gave a speech, which at the time was the most broadcast event ever televised. The president of RCA, David Sarnoff, had decided to use the 1939 World's Fair as a jumping off point to introduce America and the rest of the world to television. NBC used Roosevelt's speech to inaugurate regularly scheduled television programming. Roosevelt's speech was seen live by roughly 1,000 television owners throughout the New York City area. That number then skyrocketed after the fair. It was the second most expensive American World's Fair ever, after the Louisiana Purchase Expo of 1904. Exactly 33 countries originally participated in the 1939 fair in New York, which received over 44 million attendees throughout its two-year run. The slogan of the 1939 New York Fair was the dawn of a new day, the world of tomorrow. The fair covered over 1,200 acres of land and was the last World's Fair held until 1947, after the end of World War II, which actually broke out only four months into the 1939 World's Fair in New York. At the time of the outbreak, all the pavilions of the Axis powers were removed. We're told while the buildings of the New York's World's Fair of 1939 were primarily meant to be temporary, a number of them survived 
not only for the two seasons of the fair, but survived through to the next World's Fair in New York from 1964 through 1965 when they were reused. Even more fascinating is that a handful of these original buildings from the 1939 World's Fair still stand in New York and Flushing Park today. The pavilions, attractions, and inventions showcased at the World's Fair in 1939 were nothing short of spectacular, especially when you considered some of the pioneering technology that was first showcased here. As I mentioned earlier, the world was introduced to television for the first time at the 1939 New York World's Fair. This was a project that was almost single-handedly being associated with the company RCA. However, we have many more interesting examples of technology either introduced or showcased for the first time at the fair in 1939, and these inventions still have reverberating effects on our world today. One of the most popular exhibits at the fair was the Westinghouse Time Capsule. The time capsule, now buried some 50 feet below the ground in New York, contains the writings of Albert Einstein and Thomas Mann, as well as a Disney Mickey Mouse watch, a Gillette razor, multiple issues of Life magazine, a Cupie doll, thousands of different species of plant and food seeds, as well as millions of pages of textual information about the world contained on microfilm. The Westinghouse time capsule is not scheduled to be opened until the year 6939. However, for me, the most exquisite invention by Westinghouse, and indeed one of the most interesting aspects of the 1939 World's Fair that I've come across, is Westinghouse's Electro, the voice-activated, seven-foot-tall robot. Electro was designed and built over a year's time, from 1937 through 1938, designed specifically for the World's Fair in New York. Electro was fully voice-activated, meaning an operator or anyone with the microphone linked to Electro could use voice commands to control Electro or to ask Electro questions. Again, this all sounds like science fiction, a voice-operated robot nearly 90 years ago. However, we have multiple videos from the fair that survive showing Electro in action. Electro weighed 265 pounds and could walk on his own by voice command and could speak a variety of over 7,000 words using a 78 RPM record player that was hidden inside the machine. Electro could inhale and exhale, able to do such things as blow up a balloon, and was also able to move both his arms and his head as well as his legs. Electro had photoelectric eyes, which could identify and differentiate between green and red light. For the second year of the fair, Electro was paired with Sparky, an automaton or robotic dog, which could sit, walk, bark, and beg to the humans in attendance. Several minutes of color footage of Electro in action can be seen at 33 minutes 55 seconds in the movie, the Middleton Family at the New York World's Fair, a full-length feature film available in color, produced by Westinghouse about the World's Fair. One of the biggest mysteries of the fair occurred on July the 3rd, 1940, also known as Superman Day, when a still unidentified actor played Superman to over a hundred thousand people in the park. Superman was heavily photographed and the actor who played Superman on this day was said to leave such an impact on the fair that the mystery of his identity is still argued over to this day. The 1939 New York World's Fair was also home to the very first world science fiction convention, sometimes referred to as Nikon One. It was attended by over 200 up-and-coming science fiction writers, including Isaac Asimov, Ray Bradbury, and John W. Campbell. Ceramic sculptor Wayland Gregory created the Fountain of the Atom, which contained the four largest ceramic sculptures of modern times. These were known as the Elements, and each measured over 72 inches tall, and weighed over one ton each. There were also eight smaller electrons, also sculpted out of ceramic. Wayland Gregory would go on to create numerous sculptures for the 1939 fair, 
However, the fountain of the Adam is the most well-remembered of his work. A handful of other creations or inventions were introduced to the world for the first time at the World's Fair in New York, 1939. This included the inventions of nylon fabric, the Viewmaster, which was a cheap and modern way to view stereoscopic 3D images in a more standardized and affordable way. We also have the introduction of Smellovision and the first display of Vermeer's painting, The Milkmaid, introducing Vermeer's work to the rest of the world. The 1939 fair also saw the world introduced to the electric pencil sharpener, the precursor to fast food, a diner, which is still in operation today, known as White Mana, as well as futuristic complete car-based cities built by General Motors, and the 1939 fair also displayed the very first fully constructed computer game. At the center of the fair was a giant globe, a planetarium, which was one of the largest in the country. At the fair was displayed the first voice synthesizer, known as Bell Labs Voder, which was one of the most well-remembered musical displays of the time period. The theme center to the fair, which was to contain the most prestigious buildings of the fairgrounds, consisted of two all-white landmark monumental buildings, named the Trilon, which stood over 700 feet tall, and the Parisphere, which one entered by a moving stairway and exited via a grand curved walkway named the Helicline. Inside the Parisphere was a model city of tomorrow that visitors viewed from a moving walkway high above the floor level. Next to the business exhibits, which dominated the fair, on the streets of wheels was the Masterpieces of Art building, which housed over 300 priceless works of art by the old masters from the Middle Ages through the year 1800. Whalen, who many called the proprietor of the fair and his team, were able to procure paintings and sculptures from all across Europe. The communications and business zone of the fair showcased several trades or industries that were popular among the public at this time. It included buildings dedicated to home furnishings, plumbing, contemporary art, cosmetics, gardens, the gas industry, fashion, jewelry, and religion. The government zone contained the buildings of a multitude of different countries jam-packed into 21 different pavilions as well as several dozen smaller buildings. This included a centrally located court of the peace, a lagoon of nations, and a smaller court of the states. The roughly 60 foreign governments that initially entered the fair contributed a wide diversity of creatively designed pavilions housing a myriad of cultural offerings to fairgoers, many of which they had never interacted with before. Another large building was the Eastern Railroad's President's Conference, dedicated to rail transport. Here, the Pennsylvania Railroad displayed its powerful S1 engine, mounted on rollers under the driver wheels and running continuously at 60 miles per hour all day and all night, every day of the fair showing the reliability and power the Pennsylvania Railroad still had in the year 1939. General Motors also had on display their early electric diesel passenger locomotive, created by a subdivision of GM's Electro Motor Division. However, the most seldom discussed and seemingly lost technology of the Railroad President's Conference had to have been Italy's record-setting ETR200 electric multi-engine, which was on display running at a record-setting speed of over 126 miles per hour. Despite the high-minded educational tone that Grover Whalen attempted to set, the amusements area became the most popular part of the 1939 fair. The immensely popular but far less educational amusements area was not integrated into the thematic matrix of the fair and was classified as an area rather than a complete zone. The amusements area contained a massive roller coaster, a flying turnstile bobsled, a Lifesavers branded parachute tower called the Parachute Jump, which became the most popular ride of the fair and was actually transferred to Coney Island after the fair. The amusements area also contained a narrow gauge railway, later purchased by Kennywood, where it still runs today, as well as a little miracle town, a winter wonderland, a sun valley, a theater of time and space, and jungle land, created by Frank Buck, 
which contained shows of the most exotic animals in the world. Interestingly, we're told that the fair in 1939 was not fully illuminated as electric lighting was still relatively new to the world. I honestly can't agree with this part of the narrative, even if the current narrative does say it. We see in many of my videos, fully illuminated cities as far back as the mid to late 1800s throughout the world. I have three videos alone containing about 1,000 photographs of the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis, where it is basically entirely illuminated. To make the argument that the 1939 World's Fair was not fully electrified because the technology was relatively new does not make much sense to me at all. And I quote the narrative here, quote, Outdoor public lighting was at the time of a very limited and pedestrian nature perhaps consisting of simple incandescent pole lamps in a city and nothing in the countryside. Electrification was still relatively new and had not reached everywhere in the USA." End quote. Overall, the 1939 World's Fair in New York, the world of tomorrow, made a strong impression on attendees and influenced a generation of Americans to come. Later generations have since attempted to recapture the impression it made in fictional and artistic treatments. However, many historians believe we will never reach this level of worldwide unity ever again. I believe I'm going to wrap up my narration here, as we've really gone through the major aspects of the fair that I was looking to discuss with you. I will now allow you ample time to go back and look through all of the images and pause and read some of the lines of the official guidebook that I have provided for you. Again, this was one of my most in-depth videos I have created to date. And without your support and the donations and the meaningful comments on each and every one of these videos, this channel would not be possible. So I wanted to say thank you, sincerely. Thank you for 87,000 subscribers. I can't wait to hear from each of you in the comment section down below as I'd love to hear what stands out to you the most about the 1939 World's Fair in New York. If you'd like to support my work, there will be a link in my YouTube profile. Including Electro, the talking, walking robot who used voice-activated technology nearly 90 years ago. I really do feel the achievements of the World's Fair in 1939 are still being displayed and reflected in our society today, as many of them were far ahead of their time. The World's Fair in New York not only reshaped the history of New York and America, but it also reshaped the world after the Great Depression. It was a springboard used to catapult society into the modern era. The 1939 World's Fair served its purpose and it changed the world. But I'd love to hear what you think about this World's Fair and the technology and these photographs in the comments down below. I look forward to hearing from you and I will talk to you all on the next video. I also wanted to end this video by giving a big happy birthday to my grandfather, my grandpa, Old Poppy. He was born in 1935, the year the planning of this World's Fair began, and he is 88 this year. So happy birthday, and thank you all for joining me.